So I am pleased to introduce our workshop presenters. Uh, Michael Laurie is the founder of Garden Green, and he has been providing education on non-toxic alternatives to toxic pesticides for home gardeners, farmers, retailers, parks departments, municipalities, nonprofit organizations, and corporations. Diane Emerson joined him in, in this effort in 2014. Michael has carried out pesticide education work for a number of years, including development of educational pesticide and fertilizer purchasing guides and educational sheets on how to address particular garden problems in a green way. He's also conducted a number of home site visits to help homeowners switch to more green gardening practices. In his environmental consulting work, Watershed LLC, he has worked with hundreds of customers on their landscapes, including residential, commercial, and government for over 30 years. So a little bit about Diane. Diane Emerson is a landscape designer and maintenance professional. She advises her many clients on how best to address gardening challenges without the use of toxic chemicals. She offers organic gardening services to island residents and advises on plant selection, garden design, pruning, ecoturf, and non-chemical ways to decrease maintenance. Diane and Michael also operate a licensed retail plant nursery which specializes in native plants and medicinal herbs. Plants are sold at the Vachon's Farmer's Market and also to some of Diane's landscaping clients. No toxic chemicals are used in their nursery or anywhere on their 22 acre property, which is awesome. Many years of experience landscaping without the use of toxic chemicals has translated well into them running their nursery using the same practices. So I would like to say, Michael and Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you. One thing I wanted to say, um, I don't know how many of you know the history of the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides, but I feel honored to be working with them because their history goes way back into the 1970s. I first heard about them back then when they were working to protect tree planters you know, one of the things that was happening in the forestry industry in the Northwest, at least, is there was toxic herbicides being sprayed on forests to try to kill the deciduous plants. And then shortly thereafter, tree planters, like myself, were coming into these places being exposed to these toxic herbicides. <clears throat> Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides took up that effort to uh, try to work to stop that kind of har uh, harm to the tree planters. So I'm thankful to be, after these many years of her having heard about them, to now be working with them on this presentation. First of all, I think that most of you got this handout. There's a there's like a four page handout, and you don't necessarily you don't need to look at it now. But we just wanted to mention that it's th that it's there. Oh, I see. <laughs> Some of you were holding it up. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. Um, and so some of your questions and some of the important information is in that handout. We just wanted to mention that. And that also some of the websites for further resources are at the top of the first page of that handout. So that's, that's that. Um, another key thing before we get going is on this so on the slide you can see these are the things we're going to cover uh, generally speaking but and there's this is a huge topic you know we could go all day on this but we're not going to um but what we would like to try to do is as much as possible to make sure that we cover some of the stuff that's most critical to you so feel free to tell us uh now you know, you could raise your hand would be one way to do it. Raise your hand and, and tell us like what's a topic or an, an insect or something that you want to make sure we try to spend some time on. And and uh, to the best of our ability, we'll do that. You know, if it's not in our presentation, it'll be a little hard for us to put together something on it, maybe or not. But if it's in the presentation, we'll make sure we don't skip past it too quickly if it's important to you. To you. 
So yeah, feel free, raise your hand if there's something burning topic do you want to make sure we don't blast past too quickly. Michael, just so you know, um, we have uh, somebody mentions aphids um, and another person, two people, aphids, one leaf hopper. Okay. Got it. But we got it. Thank you. All right. So back to the presentation now. Um, basic. So here we have different topics we're going to cover the basic ways to minimize problems. And honestly, that, that's really the key that we feel. That's, that's maybe one of the most important parts of the whole deal is these different ways to minimize the problems, which we'll go into more detail later. And we'll talk about disease and insects and non-insect pests and weeds. Okay, so here are are the basic ways to try to minimize the problems. And to me, I think this is one of the most important slides, not because I'm in it, <laughs> but because it covers these things that if you do a, our experience of many, many years of gardening and growing, uh, you know, just on our own, and these things have, can make a big difference. So monitoring regularly for prevention, building good, healthy soil, diversity of plants. Um, all right, so I'm just going to go with this one. Choose plants that attract beneficials. So that photo on the top right is the angelica. And that's one of the plants that we grow that attracts a lot of beneficial insects. And um, certainly around here, especially if you have a shady area, that's a, one that we would uh, recommend growing because it's pretty easy to grow. It does most of its growth in the spring. So it doesn't need a lot of watering or care. Um, and then another one, as a lot of you may know, is yarrow uh, is pretty hardy and doesn't take a lot of care to keep it going either. One of the nursery people that we know, that point there where it says leave a tiny drip to attract frogs and birds, that's what she does in her greenhouse, believe it or not. You know, I think a lot of people maybe uh, would think that they don't, you don't want to get animals in your greenhouse, but she swears by that being a great way to um, control problems. It's just a little faucet. Good question. Yeah, it's just a little faucet dripping some water to attract the frogs and birds. Yeah, and that's that's somebody somebody here in on Western Washington doing that in their yeah. greenhouse. In a in their greenhouse. Yeah, diversity of plants. You know, again, it depends if you've got a, a particular niche in your uh, nursery where you have to focus on a few particular plants, well, then it might be a little hard for you to have diversity because you've got this business plan in a niche that doesn't allow it. But if if your plan and your, and your market will allow for it, we would encourage you to think about more diversity because the more monoculture you have, that's going to um, increase and give more for the disease and the pest insects to feed on and and likely they'll get to be a bigger problem that way. Whereas the diversity will tend to dampen that down. Also, the diversity will encourage beneficial insects in many cases. Okay. Leave some wild areas. So that photo at the top is part of a wild area kind of coming in the road to our place. And and we we're big fans of that idea. Now we get that on, with some nurseries, you really have limited space and you might find that hard to leave something in wild area, ideally wild native plants, uh, because you feel like you need to grow plants to make money on all of your property. And if that's the case, well, that's what it is. But if you have um, room, we certainly would encourage you to think about having at least a little patches here and there of wild plants. 
you know, going way back to when I bought my property almost 20 years ago, that's what I did when I put in the garden. I would leave little patches right in the middle of the area where the medicinal and the edible plants and were growing. And I found that it did, did seem to help with attracting the beneficial birds and insects. So right plant, right place. I think probably many people have heard this concept, but you know what I what we're trying what we're talking about here is ideally, uh, you know, if you're growing in a greenhouse, you can control a lot of the conditions to some degree. If you're growing outside, it's a good idea to be kind of have scoped out your property and know like where are the shady areas, where are the sunny areas. Where's the wet? Where's the dry soil? Where's the clay? Where's the sandy soil? You may even have certain areas where um, the pH is different. You know, you've got uh, areas where it's real acid soil. Maybe some aren't. And it's going to really help your plants to stay healthy and to fight off disease and insects. Um, if you can match the plants to those kind of conditions that they prefer. We've certainly seen that you can push the growing of plants beyond the preferred habitats, but you know they don't always grow great and thrive. They might get by, but they might not be as good as they could be. Okay. So I'm going to take over and do these a uh, few slides. And again, please uh, jump in if you have questions as we're doing this. So I'm going to cover uh, disease here briefly. And uh, this uh, Venn diagram here on the right is a really uh, very good because uh, if you, you need to have all three of those pieces on the outside in order to have disease show up in your nursery. And... Uh, so for instance, if you have a pathogen and you have a susceptible host, you still won't get disease showing up if you don't have a conducive environment for that. And conducive environment might mean uh, stressed plants of some sort or uh, high humidity or something like that for the particular disease. You can have a conducive environment and a susceptible host, but if you don't, if the pathogen isn't there, you won't have disease. So it's it's very interesting to think that through and apply it to your uh, to your particular situation if you do find disease in in your plants. So so the basics here are choosing disease resistant plants, and also keep in mind a lot of nurseries if they see any kind of disease they just get rid of the plants right away because it is expensive to find out what disease it is, what's causing the disease, and then expensive to treat the disease. It's often cheaper just to remove those plants right away. And so this is part of walking through your greenhouse and walking, walking the nursery every single day looking for these things. And then you don't want to compost diseased parts or plants anywhere near your growing area. Uh, and depending on what disease it is, uh, what you think it is, you might want to actually send it to the landfill. All right, uh, powdery mildew and other fungal diseases. It's good to prevent powdery mildew. That's your very best defense because once it's there, for one thing, it dis disfigures the leaves so you can't sell the plants. And it's very difficult to prevent, if not impossible, not to prevent, to stop it once it's there. So again, choose disease resistant plants, keep air flowing around your plants and prune if needed to get that air, prune other plants and prune, make sure that there is good air flowing. And you need to keep plants well watered, but not on the leaves. Some people think that when they see powdery mildew, it means that the, plants, there's too much moisture, but actually quite often it's the opposite, that they are stressed from lack of moisture and that stress causes and enables the disease mechanism to get a, get a foothold. And building healthy soil, plants can fight off a lot of diseases and insects if they're healthy. And so starting with the soil and right plant, right place and what, what things are going 
doing. Okay, next soil, next one, please. Um, uh, no, that's not what you meant. I don't know what you meant. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add something to that about the not watering the leaves. So that's, you know, that's a good argument for using drip irrigation. I imagine that a lot of you have drip irrigation for your outside plants. A little more tricky trying to do that in a greenhouse, but to the degree that you can get that water being delivered at the base of the plant instead of spraying overhead, it'll help with the powdery mildew. And also allow the surface of the soil to dry out between waterings. That helps prevent the fungal spores from germinating. Okay, so now we're on the treatments. So if you do decide that you wanna try treating, then uh, you, if you want to try something, the safest things to use, sulfur, but it needs to be as a preventative. You would apply it every seven days during wet weather. You wouldn't not you would not apply sulfur when flowers are present because it can kill pollinators. You also don't apply it in temperatures over 85 degrees Fahrenheit and not within uh, 30 days of spraying plant oils. And that is because uh, it makes it plant oils interact with sulfur to make the sulfur more toxic. And it can be so toxic it can burn the leaves. And uh, neem oil is also a fungicide, but keep in mind that it can kill beneficial insects. So back to prevention rather than treatment for these kinds of things. Any questions? Right, now we're going to cover insects. And I'll just, this is a list of what we're gonna cover here. And I don't have leafhopper on this list and I am, uh, my resources that I have available to me right now don't have, uh, anything specific to leafhoppers. So maybe uh, we'll have to pass on that or have someone else uh, offer some help when we get to other insects. Okay, so we'll do aphids, gooseberry sawfly, white fly, spider mites, fungus gnats, mealybugs, yellow jackets, wasps, and other insects. Okay, next slide, please. So aphids, a couple of folks are very interested in aphids. And um, going back to keeping your plants healthy, healthy plants resist attack. And there are some plants that actually aphids really like. I have also noticed that aphids uh, really go for plants that are have excess nitrogen, that the, the, the soft growth uh, that comes from fertilizing your plants. The aphids love that. So it's important to not over fertilize your plants if you have uh, aphid issues. Okay, Michael's found something on leafhoppers for later. Great. So, so they show up when plant, aphids show up when plants are stressed sometimes too. When you see them, hose them off, determining what is causing the stress of the plant and try to fix it. Sometimes the plants in the nursery are dried out too much or they're root bound. And sometimes just potting them up into bigger pots can help. And uh, the one grower uh, that I talked to just doesn't even bother trying to fix the problem. They just compost the plants with aphids because it, it, they just don't want to put the time into trying to solve them, solve the problem. Natural predators are great. Birds, spiders, lacewings, and ladybugs. If you want to in, in, uh, encourage these folks, you can't be spraying pesticides all over the place. Soapy or plain water daily if needed. Sticky traps help. And uh, that's a bit on, on aphids. And uh, here's, another, here's another suggestion. If you have young plant starts with, with aphids on them, you can dip them in soapy water, pot and all and then let them drain. Uh, the question, uh, talking a question, about, can you talk about the idea of planting a sacrifice plant? Well, a sacrifice plant could be a plant that you, a couple of things to, uh, one that you can really notice when, when a disease or an insect is in your, in your greenhouse or on your system, in, in your system somewhere. And you can use that as an indicator that you have a problem, or you can also have 
plants that the insects love even better. This is a very complicated area uh, to discuss about putting plants in, because the timing is important and you can't allow the insects to uh, use those plants as a way to then go back into your, your, your nursery. This is beyond the scope of our presentation today, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's an excellent question. And once again, we just want to, we pointed out in the beginning, but we just want to say it again, that we prefer that you raise your hand or you could even just jump right in with the question instead of going into the chat. Yeah, that's hard. It's the chat. Hey, Michael, gets... Diane, uh, Susan Carper has her hand raised. Yes, I know that. I can see that. But Michael just wanted to finish on that. So, uh, yes, yeah, Susan, you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, I just wanted to say, like with trap crops, one of the best things to do is look up what crop you have and, you know, study when the aphids are most likely to attack it and then find your crop that will coincide with that. Your the trap same, crop. The trap, yeah, the trap crop with your greenhouse crop or your, the, the plants that you're trying to grow. So just a matter of like looking to specifically what you're growing and and when it's a little bit harder with aphids so you just really want to have more of a um, like you were mentioning before the plants that attract the beneficials I think that's the best way with aphids absolutely yeah well thank you Susan thank you very much for sharing that I want to Thank you, Susan. I want to just build on what you said. I, it is really important as much as possible to learn ab about that insect pest or the disease, either way. The more that you learn about it, and especially with some of these insects, where I'm going is that often there's a certain time in its life cycle when it's best to try to fight it off. And so if, if you learn about that, that the certain time of year or the certain period in its life cycle, it, it's more vulnerable to be fought off, then that'll help you stay more ahead of the game. Yes, thank you. That's a good point. May we have the next slide now? Okay, uh, sawfly, including gooseberry sawfly, can be taken care of by a neem oil spray. And uh, you can find out, take a look at this. And the neem oil con contains azadiractin and other chemicals, which is why it seems to work so well on so many different things. So again, uh, it's nonspecific though, when you use uh, neem oil for these things and can kill other insects as well. Can Did I jump in on this? Yeah. So one of the things um, on the neem oil, is that there's different concentrations of neem oil for sale out there. So it's really important to look at the label. You know, for example, on this slide, we're talking about four teaspoons of neem oil with a gallon of water and with some soap. So that, that would often be what the way it would work with many varieties of neem oil. But, you know, it's just make sure, check the label and tell and see what, ratio they say to use on on the label of the actual neem oil that you are buying okay thank you i actually have a comment about neem oil that sure. i heard from my sure. greenhouse teacher and that yes. was the stuff you can get basically at your local hardware store isn't worth spraying and that you should get it from a reputable um company that sells um those sorts of products rather like a, like a greenhouse grower supply versus just your actual regular hardware store. Yes, you know, I've, I've heard that as well, that you have to be careful about the making sure you have a high quality neem oil, right? Otherwise you're just kind of doing nothing. Yes, yes, good point. Okay, white fly. So I'm gonna share with you some guidance from Arbico Organics, which is a natural IPM solutions. They, they have a guidance in their, in their catalog as well as products. And here's, I like what they have to say about whitefly. 
Uh, first, carefully inspect new plants before transplanting them. Number two, dip foliage and root ball in soapy water or hydrogen peroxide solution to clean and kill any existing whitefly eggs, nymphs, or adults. Number three, monitor pest thresholds with yellow sticky traps. Four, release green lacewing pre preventatively before infestation becomes severe, if you see some. Five, consider specialist parasites and predators for targeted whitefly infestations. Six, for quick knockdown control, consider sprays with a low environmental impact, such as Bovaria bassiana products that they sell or neem-based sprays. And seven, clean tools and equipment as well as greenhouse structures between growing seasons. There you go. I thought that was pretty darn good for uh, white fly, which can be a real problem. Uh, any questions or comments about uh, white flies? Uh, what was that company that shared that information? Yes, it's called Arbico, A-R-B-I-C-O, Organics. They have been doing this work since 1979. And their catalog has wonderful information, guidance, and net products that are all or organic or uh, predators. They, they sell how many? They sell what, um, three kinds of white fly predators and four kinds of aphid predators as well. So it's a, and, and they send out four catalogs a year, something like that. It's very good, very current. And we'll have a photo of it later. Spider mites. Arbico Organics, I was just mentioning, they have eight different products, uh, mite predators uh, in their catalog. And so neem oil is often used for uh, spider mites, but there are predators that go after spider mites and it's nice to know that they exist too. So before I forget, I'm gonna say something about the leaf hoppers since I, I jumped up to do a little checking around. And um, one of the resources you're gonna see at the very end, it's called the 2015 Directory of Least Toxic Pest Control Products. This is this is another one of these organizations that's been uh, working in this field for decades. And uh, they talked about, there's a number of, for leafhoppers, parasitic uh, insects that can be used, sticky adhesive traps and sticky tape. And in fact, they list the, our, Arbico, the one that Diane was just talking about, is one of the suppliers of the traps and sticky tape. And uh, plastic film to attract leaf hoppers, as well as barriers and exclusion devices. So, and the cool thing, again, about this 2015 directory of least toxic pest control products, they give you these solutions and then they tell you companies that sell those solutions. And, and so you can find out where to get what they're talking about, which I thought was really helpful to know about that. Um, okay, so the fungus knots, it's a greater problem when it's humid and wet, which it used to get, used to get wet around here quite a bit. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to do in the future. Um, but so that's just something to keep in mind, avoid standing water. So that, that whole moisture thing is gonna to contribute to it. Another thing is there's these different solutions. You know, one of them is you could have a deep bowl with some apple cider vinegar in it and a few drops of dishwashing soap in there that will attract them. They'll be attracted to that. There's also these uh, sticky traps that you can see in the photo. That's certainly um, another option. And, uh, Grow smart, grow safe. I'm going to mention grow smart, grow safe. And that's a really important resource 
Gross Smart, Gross Safe list sesame oil sprays is another option for this. And why am I talking about Gross Smart, Gross Safe? Well, they've been around a long time for a few decades in our neck of the woods. And it's based on the scientific research of someone who works at Thurston County, a scientist down there. And he does research every year on a lot of the different products, specifically the active ingredients of the products, to see what does the science tell us about how safe this product is. Is it safe? Is it dangerous to animals? Is it a, a water pollutant potentially? Um, and it covers a whole range of ways whether it could be safe or not. And we've, in, in our particular pesticide work, especially over the last 14 years, that's been a kind of our guiding light in deciding which whether something is safe or not. And on Vashon, at least, we've worked with the retailers to get them to mark the products and, and I apologize if you don't live on Basham, and I'll keep this short. But, you know, in one of the places, Island Lumber, all of the products that Grow Smart, Grow Safe says are safe, they have a little green tag by them. And, and in ACE, they've actually allowed us to put green, yellow, and even red to let you know which ones are the greatest risk. So... Grow Smart, Grow Safe is a great go-to source to find out which products are safe and which aren't. Okay. They, and the Grow Smart, Grow Safe also provides guidance on uh, ways to handle pest issues without using any chemicals as well. And yeah. if you do end up looking at a chemical, they also include, you can keep clicking on a, a particular product and they'll have the labels available to look at, which are also useful. Okay, so mealy bugs, lots of different solutions here. Um, as I said, Grow Smart, Grow Safe lists many safe products. One option is a 70% or less solution is isopropyl alcohol in water that you could just sort of dab on with a cotton swab. I'd encourage you to not get too carried away in doing that. Try it out on the particular plant that you have this problem on, try it out on just one plant to see if that alcohol solution is gonna cause some other trouble on the, on the leaf or not. There's many other, neem oil is also an option, also just blasting it off with water. And uh, you can prune out, if there's a light infestation, you could prune that out. And you don't wanna overwater or over fertilize because that's, a, that's another bug that can be attracted to high nitrogen uh, levels. And then there's beneficial insects available that you can use safer insecticidal soaps, lots of different products on that one. Okay, you can move on. Um, yellow jackets. So yeah, boy, I know yellow jackets because I've been stung a few times not in a greenhouse or in our garden, thankfully, but when I used to work out in the woods and kicking over people in front of me, kicking over a nest and wham. Oh, so, uh, but they can be predators of caterpillars and flies and beetle grubs. But there is basically, you can hang meat over water and oil as a way to attract them and trap them, but you have to really stay on that and, and change change the trap, you know, get rid of the old meat, get rid of whatever yellow jackets were attracted and, and move on to um, putting out a new trap with that. And there are actual yellow jacket traps that are for sale. I've actually seen some of them uh, in on some of the different hardware stores. So other insects, the first step is to identify them first. And, you know, I don't know if you knew it, but there's the master gardeners are, are out there and they help the public, of course. And it's okay if you're a professional uh, 
nursery grower, it's okay for you to, you can bring in a sample uh, plant with some kind of disease that you don't know what the heck it is or an insect, you know, and you might have to go out and, to collect that insect at night to even be able to get it. But if you bring that sample in to the master gardeners, they can send it off to the lab they work with. And, you know, but within a couple of weeks, you're going to likely have an answer. And I'm, I'm saying this because I was a master gardener for about six years, and that's the way it worked. And generally, believe it or not, generally the, the uh, mystery plants that came in, the plants with the mystery problems that came in, we usually did get some good answers. So that's that's one way you can do it. You can also send stuff in to WSU, Washington State University. They're going to charge you for their service, though. But that's just another way. But anyway, the, ma the main idea is the first step is to identify whatever this other insect or disease is. And as I said earlier, to understand its life cycle and then choose the least harmful method based on you know that what you've learned about that what the heck that plant is um so related to that sort of just some general principles on other insect problems it's a good idea to have crop rotation to interrupt the insect's life cycle you know if you keep growing the same plant in the same area year after year you're going to give that the, the uh, predator insects better chance to grow up and, and attack those plants. And uh, another idea is, you know, if you find like say flea beetles is a good example. Some, we know that some people use a flame weeder because if a flame, they found that the flea beetles were laying their eggs on this, in this area, this hard surface. So they just used the flame weeder to kill the, where the eggs were, going, were being laid. <clears throat> Back to the preventative side of this whole thing is one of the farmers on Bashan has shared with us in the multiple interviews we've done with them that they, they try hard not to use any general pesticides. Um, you know, because even some of the safer pesticides can be not so selective. Um, and they have found that the longer that they stay away from using these pesticides that aren't so selective, the better that the whole insect population, including especially the beneficial insects, beneficial insects will come back better if you're not doing anything to in, in, you know, unintentionally kill them off. Okay, now we're, so these are some of the resources that we wanted to point out, and we've made mention of a number of them. Um, there's at the top right, there's that directive of least cost pest control products. That So you can do a search and uh, you can go to the website of that organization and uh, get a copy of that product. And they uh, also have a lot of other really useful uh, information. It's the Bio Integral Resource Center. And they're based in Berkeley, California. They, so they, that's a good source. <clears throat> but if you're going to buy just one book on this topic, Absolutely, we recommend that one there where it says The Gardener's Guide to Common Sense Pest Control. That title is a little misleading. I would have called it The Guide to uh, Garden Nursery Problem Control because <laughs> it covers weeds, insect, disease, animals, covers the whole range of stuff. Um, so that's a good one. And that's there's the Arbico Organics that Diane was uh, talking about before. Does anybody here have a favorite source of uh, non-toxic problem control information? I like to use sound horticulture. They're close. 
And they are great if you don't really know and you say, here's my problem, they can help direct you to the right product. And they say beneficial insects. Yes. Okay, thank you. Nice. Okay, read the label. So obviously we've been talking about the non-toxic stuff and we're really hoping that you, that you can find ways to deal with your problems in a non-toxic way. But if you do find yourself feeling like you need to use one of the more toxic products, what we suggest is to please read the label and, and read the label for a few reasons. One, to make sure that you know how to apply it. You know, sometimes us men, I, and I say this because I've seen other men do this, is they just take the product and they think more is better and just spray hog wild. It's instead of reading the label to go, oh, I was only supposed to spray it a little bit. Um, so that's that's the aspect of it is, you know, only use what you really have to. And then, but the other thing is, Make sure you read the label and, you know, you might have to wear protective gear. You know, you might have to use a special respirator and uh, uh, maybe a big jumpsuit or whatever to protect yourself against this toxic product. Um, so this photo here, that's Thornton Creek in northern north part of Seattle. And that's one of the better salmon streams uh in seattle so why the heck do you think i have a photo of thornton creek with this really very green lawn right up the edge of it on this slide related to toxics well because to have that lawn and it's hard to tell the, from the photo but not only is that lawn super green but it's also it's, uh, yes, application leaches into the water from <laughs> Jensen. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. That's right. They probably were using um, weed and feed. And the weed part of weed and feed probably has 2,4-D or it's a weed and feed type product. And then the feed part has um, a nitrogen-based fertilizer, there's a good chance that that close to the stream that it's running right, some of it is getting right into the stream and that especially the 2,4-D part is harmful to the insects and the salmon in the stream. So if you feel compelled to use a more toxic product, even you know once or twice or whatever, Try hard not to use it right up next to a place, right next to a stream where there's salmon, you know. Try to keep a buffer between the area that you use it and that salmon stream. Michael and Diane, I just wanted to note there is a in the chat a few comments back from Johan, a comment and a question about yellow jackets and wasps. Tend to be good beneficial insects which help to control pest insects. What was the goal for control of those species? In general, most of these species aren't overly aggressive unless they're located in a bad spot where they get disturbed by people. Well, Beck, I'll, I'll just say, I think Diane's going to have something to say, but I, uh, I think that's true if they're not in a spot uh, where you're going to be walking. In my, my experience of them, has been when uh, people kicked open their nest on on a trail. And uh, so if, if you can be very observant and uh, avoid the places where they put their ground nests, you probably can have peace with them without having to try to control them. You know, it kind of depends on your situation. If it's if it's a random, not so often thing, maybe you can easily find peace with them. And I'd like to add that the uh, paper wasps are surprisingly gentle. Uh, people see, oh, it's a wasp, and they don't, uh, and they want to kill it right away. Uh, and even even uh, paper wasps are are. It takes a lot to get one of them to sting you. I I was pruning an apple tree 
uh, this summer, and uh, they were trying to get my attention. They finally bumped my forehead. I said, okay, what's going on? And then I saw their nest was two feet away from me. And uh, I said, okay, I'll leave. And they were just watching me, but they never stung me. They were just trying to get my attention. Now, ground wasps don't do that. So, so there's a new message. The only ones that I've found to be really aggressive are the bald-faced hornets, which can nest in the ground or in branches. All the other species I've encountered have been much more forgiving, even if you're near their nest. That's my experience as well. Yeah. So we're with you on that. And, you know, you may not, that may be one. That's a good point you bring it up. That, that may be, even the more aggressive ones may be something that it's, there's no need to control them. You know, one one thing that I forgot to say on, on this whole subject that we're covering here is not each solution works for everybody or is needed for everybody. Um, it, it really depends. You need to know your situation. You know, for example, rodents. You may have a big rodent problem, and we're going to get into that, but and uh, some of the traps and other solutions for rodents uh, may not work as well for you because you have so many rodents. So a lot of it has to do with just how big of an infestation or problem do you have? Because a few, uh, few insects that are maybe of some uh, impact on your plants or you, you know, maybe the best thing is to just live with them. Okay, so we're going to now go in into slugs, rodents, and deer. So slugs. So I've I have done uh, we we have done a lot to try to address slugs around here, and honestly, one of the best things that I found was to go out every morning and spend an hour or two walking around. It's the time of year when the slugs are, are most active and just collect them and put them in a, like a metal can, like is in that photo at the top there. Collect them for an hour or two and then and kill them and do that day after day religiously for at least a week, maybe 10 days. Um, and I've actually had the best success in the year. Like if, if I will do that in one particular year, I'll notice that the next year, the slugs aren't as bad anymore. There certainly are other solutions, like, you know, people I know that have had ducks in their um, landscape to eat slugs. There's different types of traps. You know, you can take like a little plastic container dig a little hole in the ground to put that plastic container that like maybe that some hummus came in for example and the, but you take the top off and you've got that now in the ground so that the top of the container is level with the soil level but the rest of the container is down in the ground a bit and you can put beer in there yeah i see that johan has been experimenting with leaving the leopard slugs uh, and, I, and Diane will say something about that I, in a second. Um, but the beer in that container I was talking about, uh, the well, I've had good luck with that. The beer, the slugs will go for that container and they'll drown in the beer. With um, smiles on their faces. Yeah, so not so bad. They they got, their last time on on, or on life was being drunk. Um, and then there's sluggo, the iron phosphate sluggo can work pretty well, limited harmful impact, except that can be harmful to your pets. So you got to be careful where you're putting it. And it kills invertebrates. Yeah, so it can kill a lot of other stuff that you don't want to kill. Then there's copper, like, like a copper metal strip that you see in that picture there. That's going to be pretty pricey these days. You can get copper tape. We have put copper tape around a lot of our container plants and around our raised beds, and we've had pretty good success. Not 
there's some slug, there's some punk slugs that'll just go right over the copper, but most don't. Um, do you want to say something about the particular leaving some of the slugs? Oh, uh, I think about that, the uh, the leopard slugs when I see them and I know that they eat other slugs, but I, I destroy those as well simply because they're also going to go after our native banana slugs and I want the native banana slugs uh, to survive. I relocate the banana slugs and I and I kill the others as I go out and, and find slugs or they find them as I'm doing my work in the nursery. Okay, so there... No, the copper tape doesn't have to be electrified. And in fact, it it creates on its own some kind of electrical charge. Diana's going to say something about it. Yes, this is very interesting. Uh, I think that it works, and it does work. It really does work. They, they avoid it. And I think one of the reasons they avoid it has something to do with the fact that unlike us, slugs use we use iron to carry oxygen around our body. They use copper. So they're they're so they are probably getting a bit of a some kind of an electrical charge when they touch uh copper. And that uh keeps it doesn't, you know, kill them or anything, but it's like this is really uncomfortable. I'm getting out of here. There you go. Okay. So Diane's gonna take the last uh, set of slides here. I just had a quick question for you, Michael and Diane. Um, I used to farm for the last four years and I had trouble with uh, slugs, obviously. And um, I was able to successfully take like eggshells or something that's jagged um, and kind of break it up around the spots where they go. And that kind of keeps them from moving into some of the areas. It's not a hundred percent, but it works pretty well. It kind of breaks up their, their pathway. Yes, they don't like uh, crawling across things that are sharp, like yeah. uh, 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 and eggshells would would do that, or or gravel, or uh, uh, things that are uncomfortable for them to crawl across. That's very true. I haven't found that much success with eggshells for us, though. Um, they'd have to be kept dry because when they get wet, they probably are easier to crawl over. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. But again, let me just jump in. You know, if that worked for you, Charlene, wonderful. Yeah. And again, it's not every solution works for everybody in all situations. But thankfully for many of these problems, there are multiple solutions. Yeah, I just wanted okay. to point out next to slide, everybody. Please. Or is next really? slide, huh? Next I'm slide. sorry. Just really quickly, I want to just say Laura has been popping in some NCAP resources into the chat for those that um, could be interested. There's some on yellow jackets. There's some on slugs. We've done a number of these. So uh, please, you know, and also take a look at our website. I'll give you that information later. Thanks, guys. Sorry. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. Rodents. So uh, with rodents, if you have a rodent problem, uh, quite often it means that you are feeding them somehow. They've got to, they they don't hang around very much at all unless they're getting fed. And so if you are feeding, if you have chickens, if you're feeding the birds, you are going to have rodents. There's just no way around it. And uh, the first thing, if you have a, a, <clears throat> a rodent issue is figure out a way to stop feeding them, stop uh, allowing them access to the chicken food or the bird food or the cat food or the dog food or whatever, if you possibly can. That will help a lot to reducing the rodent population. Uh, if you, for a building you that they're in, work on sealing the entrances. And uh, foam, foam spray is great, but you'll want to use, uh, they'll chew through that. So you'll want to put a, a wire mesh in there first before you start doing the foam spray. Encouraging predators helps. Owls uh, certainly love rodents. The photo of the barred owl in this slide is uh, uh, from our property where, where there was a, uh, there were um, mice going after and rodents going after the fruit that had fallen from our fruit trees. And uh, we came out and this owl was, let us get within five feet of it, which was really amazing. So uh, giving them a place where they can they can be above the the ground and uh, 
and freely fly down would be to, to capture a rodent is a good idea. And uh, sonic or uh, plant oil repellents are fine for enclosed places. If you're having problems with, unrelated to your nursery, but if you're having problems with rodents chewing the wires in your vehicles, there are, uh, uh, a peppermint is a good uh, repellent for that underneath the hood of the truck or car. And uh, please don't use poison because it goes through the whole ecosystem. When the other creatures eat the rodents, then they get poisoned as well. So use traps and please outside cats. You can't guarantee that they're gonna go after rodents. They might be going after songbirds and native birds. So that would be much better. So on the, if you are having a problem and you want to, one of the things that, you want to trap, but you don't want to harm your birds and so forth. One idea here is uh, to put rodent traps inside a five gallon bucket. The five gallon bucket would have holes cut at the base about one inch wide to allow rodents in, but not your chickens. And you put the traps inside the bucket with sunflower seeds and peanut butter. And then you put a concrete, put the lid back on and put a concrete block on top of the bucket so it doesn't get turned over. So that is uh, one solution for trapping if you're if you're also having chickens and you want to uh, protect your chickens from it. I'd like to see if other people have some ideas about rodents that they have found that's worked really well for them. I was using the rat X, mouse X stuff on my farm. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, and that is the one that contains the corn gluten meal, which I know there is definitely um, two stories of that, I think, or two, two sides of that on whether that works, um, depending on the setting. Uh, but I apparently rodents cannot digest it. So that is why um, they make those products. Yes, that product uh, does work. It works well uh, if you don't have other food that they can have access to. I I used that for a while, and then I thought about what how awful of a death it is, and so for them. And I I have gone to electronic traps that electrocute them right away, as the most humane way for me to. Uh, to kill them if I need to kill them, if I can't just repel them in some way or keep them from getting in. Yeah, but that that does work. The rat X and mouse X does work. And it doesn't, and, 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 and rodents that die from that are not poisoning other creatures. It's only the rodents that, that get killed from that. Okay, thank you for mentioning that. Deer, our favorite. <laughs> <laughs> people people try many things to deter deer, but really, and when it comes down to it, it's going to be fencing is uh, your best bet for deer. And you can have you know two two shorter fences that they they can't uh, jump over, uh, or one tall fence. And but it is important when you do fencing for deer to keep in mind that they will dive under fences. Uh, if it's a fence they can get under. So if it's a plastic netting kind of fence and you say, how are they getting in? Well, I have seen them dive under fences like that and uh, um, get inside and get back out again of a, of a place that they want to go eat. So you can try deer out, motion detectors. A lot of these things will work for a while. In, uh, on Vashon, uh, deer out must work quite well because they sell it in big gallon containers uh, in the in the hardware store. The trouble is you have to, of course, keep keep reapplying it uh, whenever it rains. Do it. Does anyone have any favorite uh, repellents or things for deer that uh, other folks might not know about? It helps. I know it helps uh, if you have uh, big dogs. When I go to my gardening clients and I see that there's very little deer damage, I think they've got to have dogs. And quite often they do because they're, you know, the deer will stay away from them because they're wolves. Uh, and Ben Smith says adult male human urine. Well, there you go. I did not know that that would work. Michael, have you tried that? Uh, uh, I haven't tried it. Uh, but I will say this, that I know one of the 
one of the farmers on Vashon has sworn by that one to me as well. So that's not the first time I've heard that as a solution for deer. I think that's a great one to try. It's free. Why not? And if you're out in the woods or, or in a private area, go for it. Yeah, they smell the pheromone in it. So that is what I think keeps it away. And same with the dog pee. Like my dogs definitely pee like a perimeter around the property. So that's kept a lot of animals out, which is nice. Okay, uh, before I even talk about weeds, I'd like to know if weeds are an issue for folks in the nursery area. Can I want to even show even go there? And talk um, about yes, they can be an issue, especially that tiny green stuff that once it gets big, it just pops all over the place. Yeah, in the pots. In the pots, but it's also on the ground. It comes in and plants that we get from nurseries, you know, greenhouses. And it's just mostly I feel a problem because as a retail nursery, I don't really want to you know, contribute to people's weed problems at home. So very true. yes, yes, very true. So it's important to keep those the weeds if they start in the pots in your nursery to uh, you don't want to you don't want to sell those along with your the plants to your clients because you don't know what you're giving them. So it's uh, I would like to know. So you know, other than just keeping those pots clean and keeping them moving through uh, the nursery, does anyone here have any suggestions for those kinds of weeds that that has worked uh, successfully for them, other than manually removing them as they show up? Or getting rid of them when you pot the plants up to a bigger size pot, and we're and we're talking about the the weeds, especially in the pots. We'll have a little more to say about weeds in the landscape, but just weeds in the pots. So, if you have weeds in the growing area outside your nursery, in, in the nursery, uh, and uh, it, to keep away from using glyphosate-based herbicides, safer chemicals would be horticultural vinegar which is a really strong uh, acetic acid vinegar, which you have to do gloves and eye protection and rubber gloves and eye protection and long pants and shirts because it can burn you too. Uh, Bonide burnout, pulverized weed and grass killer, ammoniated soap of fatty acids. These are safer, but they are, you also need to be uh, careful with these products. I prefer, I don't use any kind of chemicals myself. I go for tools and I have found some wonderful tools that help with weeds. So I imagine some people have problems with blackberries and uh, they're certainly very problematic in uh, here where we live. And I have found a shovel that works exceptionally well on blackberries. It's called the sawtooth shovel. And you see the base of that shovel at the pointy things on there. That those will uh, get stuck into the knuckly root of a blackberry, and then you can pry the whole thing out. You get it all out at once. Do this, of course, after the fall rains come, anytime during the winter and early spring when the soil is soft. So I highly recommend this for anybody that's dealing with blackberries. I can get them out of a of a shrub. I can a, a group of shrubs. I can get them out from against fence posts, etc. It works very well. And drip irrigation for weeds, this is very good because you can better target the water to the plants you want to grow instead of watering the weeds. And of course, of course mulching is, is very good uh, for to keep weeds down. And uh, I don't use, landscape fabric is okay. It's for a temporary basis, but not as a permanent thing because Weeds will grow right on top of it, sprout, seeds will sprout and get their roots through that fabric. And then you have a problem that you can't even dig out after that. Okay, I know we're running out of time here, so I'm just going to go on to the next slide. And just a few lovely quotes for, for folks. The best fertilizer is the gardener or the nursery person's shadow. Uh, working in nursery requires lots of water, most of it in the form of perspiration. And it's utterly forbidden to be half-hearted about growing in a nursery. You have to got, you've got to love your nursery, whether you like it or not. <laughs> 
and other resources. We've talked about these. Michael has shown these, but here's another here's another list of them. So just a reminder about these. All right. Um, if anybody had any uh, questions that may have been missed in the chat, um, now's the time when you can go ahead and ask. I um, also wanted to point out um, and thank Michael and Diane. Uh, what a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I also would take this time right now to uh, point out some contacts um, if you guys need some more assistance. Um, the contacts at NCAP would be our website. Um, we've been around for 45 years, as Michael was saying. We've been around for quite some time, 1977. Uh, we've created a nice website that has lots of really useful resources, everything from yellow jackets to weeds to you know anything. And we also have a consultation service um, that you know you do a 30 set, 30 minute consultation. Uh, with one of our staff members, which is usually myself. Um, and then we can help you either get a referral for pest control, or if you have a question that can't be, you know, uh, figured out by the website or any of the resources, we're happy to help. Um, you can also always reach out to me at speterson at pesticide.org. Um, I am the, the staff scientist at NCAP, so I can usually answer your question. If not, I can research it for you. Um, and then also uh, Garden Green, if you would like to reach out to them um, at their gardengreen.org website. I'm very grateful for your the comments that you've made and the ideas you've suggested in the chat that we didn't actually get to talk about in the presentation, but we've got it now. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff in here, which I've utilized a lot of this myself. Um, I've trapped tons of rodents. I'm a biologist by trade. So I've done everything from live trapping to some of the things that Diane was mentioning and others. Um, yeah, they can become a real pest. Although uh, when I lived in Southwest Washington, I noticed that a lot of the mice that we had were native mice. Um, and, you know, like Diane was saying, I didn't want to kill them because uh, they're not, you know, the, the non-native guys that you normally would think about coming into your house, like a house mouse. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good, good ideas on this chat. So thank you guys for sharing. Uh, there's a question from Island Home Center in Lumber. Any input on controlling the grubs and lawns that attract crows? We don't have any lawn, so... Uh... Uh, and when, and I have not had any clients that have had this problem, so I'm not familiar right. with it. I wonder if it would be similar with like using, uh, like biocontrols, Michael and Diane, I think about like a root weevil, for instance, there are a few biocontrols that you can put like a, a nematode that you can put in the soil. Um, I wonder if that would control, I don't know exactly what kind of oh, crops. And that's the problem. You need to know exactly what's causing the problem. Right, right. I was just about to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I went back to one of my uh, master gardener sources from Oregon State University and Washington State University. Uh, it's on insects. And they say beneficial nematodes for biological control. Unfortunately, and see, here's the thing with the Master Gardener info, is they present the, the green and safe alternatives, but also the not so safe. And so the chemical they recommended was amylocroprid, which is one of the ones that's harmful to bees. So I, mm -hmm. I would stay away from that, but the beneficial nematodes would be a potential solution. I, in the uh, Gardener's Co Guide to Common Sense Pest Control, they list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve 10, 12 different insects, caterpillars that damage lawns. You might be talking about the sod webworm, which, uh, which is very damaging. And uh, it is important to accurately identify webworms live in the thatch layer of the lawn rather than the soil. So you could check and see if you need to dethatch your lawn. That might be one, one possibility. 
I just want to mention, because it's kind of on my mind, like the crows are actually the solution in this particular problem. It's just that they're annoying. <laughs> <laughs> they tear up the lawn so badly. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that makes me think of, we have a partner, um, the Wild Farm Alliance, and they actually, they work more with farmers than they do with nursery growers or any other industry, but they use birds as as control all the time. So it's actually kind of a cool, uh, cool idea. So bringing in certain birds that would be, you know, correcting their pest problems. Yes, it's always, I find it incredibly fascinating to think about, okay, I have a pest. What eats this pest? Mm -hmm. And how can I encourage what eats this pest to come here? There's the table set. Let's go. And I think Diane and Michael brought up a couple of great things, you know, in talking about the least toxic pesticides, you know, they have the least toxic in the title, but that doesn't mean that they're still, you know, 100% safe or you should be, you know, blasting the ground with it. Like it really still needs to be, you know, a really specific spot that you're, you know, trying to, uh, if it's a pest or a weed, trying to target, target spraying. I do have a question about, um, when you're using soap and vinegar or baking soda, does anybody know if that's harmful to pollinators? Hmm. Well, it would certainly be harmful to them if they came in contact with it when you're when yeah. you're spraying it. I mean, they're gonna acid horticultural vinegar is nasty stuff. So, uh, you you will definitely be killing some kind of insects as you're working on spraying weeds with something like that. Well, I'm thinking of the downy mildew and how to reduce, like I found a product that works, but how do I keep the pollinators from that plant while I'm treating the mildew? You try, for one thing, you would not ever treat it when it's in bloom, when the plant's in bloom. Okay. So if it's not in bloom, it's okay? It's okay, except for the insects that might be using, if they're butterflies or moths, it might be using that particular uh, plant as a host plant for their babies. Hmm. Okay, I just have a cup, I have two or three things that, that in the nursery setting have issues with fungus. So I'm trying to, figure out how I'm going to prevent that fungus, but also protect our pollinators. Yes, I would work on the cultural issues, growing very, very healthy plants that uh, have the right amount of sun uh, uh, versus shade. I notice that I have too much shade and I try to go sun loving plants and they get diseased. I move them into the sun and the new leaves come out beautifully healthy. <laughs> one yeah, thing, we, the greenhouse. The one, the one plant that we have the most trouble with is bee balm. And bee balm is notorious for downy mildew. Yes. And I'm not even sure how to deal with it because it doesn't seem to matter what you do. It just, I mean, airflow possibly. Yeah, it's also a candidate to not even grow for your nursery. Right, I, I'm wondering if that's the solution I'm, we're gonna come <laughs> Some, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had the same problem of trying to grow bee balm periodically and I've had that trouble with it outdoors. Uh, back to the greenhouse thing, though, I did want to mention that one of the more successful greenhouse growers that we know is just absolutely vigilant and dedicated to the notion that in the off season, she cleans, totally cleans out the greenhouse and cleans the, the glass cleans the whole greenhouse, has all the plants out of there, and then bakes it, you know, ideally. So ideally, of course, you know, this is random to some degree, but she tries to find a time when the sun's going to be out, and she then she really lets that greenhouse bake. So she locks it up, lets the sun beat down through the glass, and heat it up, and kill any fungus and stuff that's going to be growing in there. And uh, and she has found that that religious 
cleaning every year like that has helped her to minimize the problems. You know, nothing's perfect, but that's worked well for her. But I do appreciate everybody attending today. This has been a great conversation. Um, I hope that we can bring more of these to you guys here in the, the next year.